Hello, my name is Adam Nee. I'm a visiting fellow at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at the Australian National University. Here with me today is Professor Roger Bradbury. Uh, he is um, a professor at the National Security College here at the Australian National University, and we're here to discuss the government's recent decision effectively banning Huawei and ZTE from the building of Australia's next generation 5G network. Welcome, Roger. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thanks for being here with us today to talk about this really important issue um, that has been buried under the political circus that we've had uh, over the last week. Um, could you just give us some background to um, the latest decision by the government to ban these uh, Chinese telecom giants? I think, I think this has been a decision that's been a, not a long time coming, but it's been bubbling away for the last, for, for the last little while. The, uh, there's a pervasive anxiety in the national security community, both, uh, both the government officials and the researchers in academia, that Chinese technology companies uh, don't behave as other companies do in, in the Western world. Right. And there's, and, and there's a, a, a nagging feeling that they'll be used by their, their government, the Chinese government, to do bad stuff to us, yeah. and so while it while it look, while it's thinly veiled uh, the, the decision as a as a decision of, uh, without naming any companies, it's very clear to anyone that's been watching this that it is targeted at the at the two big telcos or two big telecommunications and electronics companies, uh, ZTE and Huawei. Uh, Huawei has got a little bit of a uh, little bit of a track record. Um, it's uh, and people aren't have uh, have caught it out once or twice in the past, right. and I think uh, the the government's taking uh, a cautious view about uh, a cautious stance about how how we should handle this this issue into the future. Right, and the government in making this announcement has cited national security concerns. Um, could you just give us some idea of what these national security considerations might be and how they might affect? Yeah. Um, Australia's interests. Yeah, to to put it very plainly, I think where the national security community is worried that because of the complexity of modern telecommunications uh, hardware and software, that it's easy, f relatively easy, to put in what are called what people loosely refer to as back doors into the soft in, in into the systems, where uh, intelligence agencies. Uh, can use get in get into the system quietly and listen and steal and uh, and uh, su generally surveil and perhaps even uh, do uh, do uh, sabotage in one way or another. In other words, build the capacity to shut the system down should um, the telecommunication system down should uh, uh, that be that be a requirement at some time in the future. So it's a uh, so they're big ticket items we're talking about. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and 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 the anxiety is that um, that it's very hard for uh, uh, a, a Chinese company to assure Western customers mm -hmm. that it that it's not in that it's not engaged in that. The proof, yeah. the the onus of proof, unfortunately for them, is on them. And it's very hard for them to assure yeah. that that they're not engaged, that they they can't be wittingly or unwittingly engaged in this process. Right. And as you pointed out, that um, this decision, while not naming these Chinese companies, are thinly veiled, um, uh, excluding Chinese companies only from the 5G network. Mm. Is there anything special about Chinese company and the nature of the Chinese state that makes it more... Uh, worrying than yeah. perhaps companies from other countries. Yeah, I I, th I think you have to you have to stand back and look at a and, and look at a larger picture of of China and where it's going and its rise and its incredible development over the last over the last twenty or thirty years. Uh, but but inside that development, you, you need to, it it makes it look as if China is uh, what we, what looking at it from the West we would say as a normal state. Um, that it has a rule of law, it behaves in certain ways, it, uh, and 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 that it's, and that the um, 
the firms and businesses inside the state are also like normal Western, like normal Western, uh, or what we consider to be normal Western companies uh, that are uh, responsible to their shareholders and so on. But that's not so. Mm. China is a has a rule of law, but the but the party a rule of law with small r and small l. But the party sits over the top of that, Absolutely, and ultimately, yes. and and ultimately, the party can can change that rule of law at a at mm. the stroke of a pen. And companies must respond to that. It's inconceivable that a Chinese company could say no to a request from uh, a, a Chinese government agency to do something, mm. uh, whereas uh, uh, a, a Western company can. Mm. Uh, they may end up in court fighting the government against something, but but that's par for the course. Mm. Uh, that doesn't happen in China. So ch Chinese... Chinese companies that can be used as agents of the interests of the Chinese state, and those interests can include the need for intelligence, the, the sorts of intelligence operations which include surveillance, uh, 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 exfiltration of information, yep. and also uh, sabotage yep. or preparations for sabotage in time of yep. in time of a crisis. And ultimately, this goes to the fundamental nature of the um, Chinese Party state and how the Chinese Communist Party controls the whole system. Indeed. Um, and that it rules by law instead of uh, have rule of law, Indeed. as we would like yes. to think. Yeah. yeah. Now that's that, that's a very good way, uh, very good way to put it. Um, it's uh, it sits it sits above the law, whereas in Western societies the law sits above um, the politicians uh, and the people in power. In principle, sometimes that's stretched a little bit, but broadly the systems operate differently, and we need to recognize that a company like Huawei, um, even though it looks like a normal international corporation, uh, is not. All right. It's, it, it operates under, under different terms, particularly on its home turf. Right. And it seems to me that um, given so much attention on 5G and Huawei, but this is only the, the beginning of a long debate that we'll be having in this country in relation to working with and importing technology. Yeah from places like China, where the political system is vastly different and where increasingly more advanced technology is coming from in terms of AI and autonomous technology yeah. and fintech. So do you think that, um, how, how would this debate develop in, in the future? Do you have any inklings about that? And how important is the current Huawei case to the future of Australia's um, technology, technological yeah. progress. I think the this the Huawei issue, the, the decision that's been made, is a kind of a an exemplar issue, and and it's going to this is going to play out in in into the medium term at least. We've we're increasingly all countries are increasingly enmeshed with each other in terms of technology transfer and in terms of the supply chain of materials that go to make up modern life. Uh, so bits and pieces are cobbled together from this country and that country and they're assembled, finally assembled X and Y. So assuring the supply chain and assuring the final product is going to become an increasingly difficult thing, particularly when countries like China are involved in that, as they will be. So we have to, we have to develop uh, processes and, and approaches that allow us to look to measure the risks in individual cases. So a lot of it, at least at least for the next little while, is going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. As we say, do we take this new technology in? What's, what's the risk? How do we assess it? Can we do it? Uh, is there an alternative with, with a lower risk? Mm. Uh, and I think that's going, to be the, that's going to be the case. And particularly with 5G, 5G is the beginning of the next generation technology backbone absolutely for yes. the for, uh, not only for Australia but for the world and we want to make sure that the, the foundations of that process are solid and reliable and trustworthy and so we can't so in a sense the risk level we can accept for this part of the system is much uh, the, the the level of risk we can't tolerate very much risk hmm. for for this part we may be we may be have more uh, we may be more uh, risk uh, happy uh, mm -hmm. 
for other parts of it. But as we're building this next, this the the next generation, on which a whole lot of uh, other pla other platforms, I guess you might call them, things to do with the Internet of Things, are going to be built. Uh, we need to be sure that we're building a solid uh, a solid uh, system whose risks we understand. Mm. And, and the sense that I get from you is that we're still in that kind of transition period where we're not really sure what to do with um, these cases, um, Huawei in this case and 5G, but increasingly down the track with other technology from China, uh, from Chinese companies with national security implications and that we're really in a flux and that this debate is going to be continuing for yeah. a long time. Yeah, I think I think you're right. We're not in a we're not in a an area of settled policy, settled yeah, government policy. Absolutely. It's it's responsive at the moment to particular events. We're not in an, we're not in an uh, in an era of clarity about the way these supply chains work and the processes we need to put in place to assure them. We don't have any of that. We're not we're not in a place where we even understand what the what the full palette of new technologies will be that hang off all of this because they're changing very fast too. So we're, we're, we're running to keep up with the technology change and we're, we're sort of doing as, as well as, as best we can. We saw, we saw the, the UK government some years ago have to, as it were, back engineer uh, the arrival of Huawei into their system. That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. And that that was presented to them as a fait accompli by British Telecom, which was a private company, uh, and they knew no, they knew nothing about it. The British Telecom hadn't assessed the risks very well, and the the government had to come in after the fact and try and and try and put a measure of um, confidence in in how and how these technologies worked worked together the new technologies with the Huawei technology, uh, and that was that was a very uh, fraught. Period for all, uh, including including Huawei. They they weren't expecting this. They they behaved, uh, at least in a commercial sense, behaved properly, did all the right things, and suddenly they were being asked to to go a further step. We're trying to sort of get on the front foot and get ahead of this problem. Absolutely, uh, yes. By doing it this way. Absolutely. Well, thanks very much, mm -hmm. Roger Bradbury, for joining us today mm -hmm. on this important issue. And I think there's going to be a lot more debate going forward on Australia's technological future and how we can harness the benefits of technology while ensuring security. So thank you very much. Well put. Thank you, Adam.